Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to be talking about PSR 14 today. My name is Larry Garfield. You may know me online as Krell. If you want to make fun of me on Twitter during the talk, that's where you do so. Uh, I am the Director of Developer Experience at Platform SH. We're a continuous deployment cloud hosting company. That we're not talking about that at all, though, here. I'm, I'm a mem yeah, member of the PHP FIG core committee. More on that later. Uh, and I do in implement PSR 8. Who actually gets that joke? The people who are in my last talk. OK. <laughs> all right, so we're talking about events. What is an event? Well, according to the dictionary, an event is something that happens. That's helpful, right? OK. <laughs> if we're talking about events in PHP, there's a couple of things that we could mean. We could be talking about extension point mechanisms. A lot of systems use things called events as a way to allow libraries to be extensible. We could be talking about a stream of actions of some kind, an event stream in, in uh, event sourcing. We could be talking about asynchronous loops. If you're in an asynchronous system, there's often an event loop that's uh, managing the core of the system. We could be talking about user data, talking about calendars. Oh my god, let's not talk about those. I hate those. I've had to write them before. <laughs> Sorry, flashback. Or we could be talking about things like this conference. All of these are events. For today, I'm only going to be talking about that first one. If you're here for one of those other topics, then I'm sorry, you're in the wrong room. If you want to leave now, I won't be offended much. No one's leaving. Good. <clears throat> so we're talking about extension point mechanisms. And this is the, the problem space where we have component A that wants to do something when component B does something. That's our general problem space. How do we solve this problem? Generally speaking, there's two approaches that systems use. Uh, direct observer. This is your classic observer pattern for those who know your, your gang of four classic design patterns. In this case, object B has a list of observer objects that it maintains, that it's been told about. The component A registers with B and says, hey, when thing happens, let me know. Then when thing happens, B iterates through that list and says, hey, I did a thing. Hey, I did a thing. Hey, I did a thing to each one of those. And A can do its thing. Cool. The other option is mediated observer, which is essentially the same thing, but mediated. In this case, B only references a single mediator object of some kind. And then component A registers with that mediator. And then at some point, B does a thing and, tr and triggers the mediator to say, hey, I did a thing. And the mediator then has a list, and it calls all of them and says, hey, B did a thing, B did a thing, B did a thing. And that works too. In practice, nearly everyone does the second option. I rarely will see this uh, option done in PHP. You've probably seen this model a lot because so many different frameworks do it in some fashion. Who's a Symfony developer here? Good sized chunk of the room. Symfony Event Dispatcher, that's what we're talking about here. You've got um, a listener, you register a listener, and then you trigger some event uh, with a name, and then you can examine the event afterward to take appropriate action. Laravel also has an event system that is different. In this case, you trigger it with either the event uh, utility function or the static method call on the event class. Same basic idea, different set of functionality that, that it'll support. Who's uh, who is the Laravel people in the room? Laravel? OK. How about who's used the uh, PHP League of Extraordinary Packages event dispatcher? Few people. Same basic idea. In this case, you can emit an event by name only, without a class, or you can event, emit an event class that has a specific interface that has a method on it that specifies the name. Uh, and then you can also emit them in batches for those who get the American reference. No one, OK. Zen Framework. Who's used Zen Framework? Cool. You've probably seen this <coughs> uh, in Zen. It's called Trigger Event. You're on an event manager, and you give that event. You can also tell it to trigger until, and then say, keep triggering this event until one of the, uh, until some condition is met, and then stop, list, stop uh, firing all of the other listeners that have been registered for it. <clears throat> Who's used Drupal? These are number of people. Drupal hooks, same thing. And in this case, uh, Drupal uses, er, does everything with functions. So you have a, some module name. Uh, in the system, and a pizza arrived event name, 
and then you call module invoke all. And in this case, instead of passing an object, you just pass additional parameters, and those get mapped into uh, the function when it gets called. And then those will, the return value of all of those functions comes back as an array. And Drupal also now supports the Symfony event dispatcher sometimes for some things. It's kind of confusing, whatever. Who's used Typo3? Couple of people. Same idea here. Typo3 actually has, again, multiple different event systems in it. This is the newer one. Um, it's called Signal Slot Dispatcher, but it's doing essentially the same thing, but with, I don't fully understand from its documentation what all of those pieces are, but you're, you're registering an event on an object and a specific, um, for the event is also a namespace to the class, I believe. All of these are solving the same basic problem, making your system extensible in some fashion. All of them are doing the same conceptual thing in different incompatible fashions with different amounts of functionality. Like, do you pass an event object or an event string? Or both? Or neither? Can the listeners return values? If the listeners return values, does that mean stop the event? Or does it mean here's a value to give back to the caller? This is all completely incompatible between all of these systems that are trying to do the same basic thing. So if you're a module developer, you're a library developer, you want to build a freestanding library that is compatible with as many frameworks as possible, which one of these should you use? Yeah. You don't actually have a good answer here. You can depend on the Symfony event dispatcher, and then you plug into Symfony just fine, and if you want to be used with anything else, then great. You have to pull along a completely other event dispatcher in addition to whatever that framework has. You want to use it uh, just use the Laravel event dispatcher, great. You can't actually pull that out. Your, your code is now coupled to Symfony, excuse me, to Laravel only. And you can't use it with anything else. This is not good. This is a bad situation to be in. Because as a library author, I want to have to target only one extension mechanism so that my library can be used with any framework. I don't want to have to write a different version of my library for Symfony, for Laravel, for Zen, for Drupal, for Typo3, for Easy Platform, and so on and so on and so on. That's terrible. <laughs> All right, let's fix this problem. So, you know, th this is a problem. What do we do about it? Let's fix it. Enter the PHP fig, framework interoperability group. Who's heard of the fig before? Okay, most of the room. Good. Where it's the uh, PHP's informal de facto uh, standards body. Uh, I'd like to refer to us as the United Nations of PHP with all the good and bad implications that has. Take your pick. Uh, we are responsible for producing PHP standard recommendations. You are almost certainly using at least some of these. If you're doing anything with auto-loading, uh, that's PSR0, PSR4, uh, auto-loading standards. Coding standards, PSR2, used by these days almost everybody. Um, if you're using caching, then you're probably using either PSR6 or PSR16, so like caching standards. Logging, pretty much everyone is going to use a PSR3 based logger these days. HTTP handling, uh, PSR7, request response objects, and other tooling built on top of that. You're pr pretty much guaranteed to be using that unless you're using Symfony. Um, and FIG also has this really cool poster you can get. It's actually from uh, Ben's, uh, Beck Simonson, uh, who does a series of open source art. I put this up here because we needed a logo, and uh, I have the original painting at, at home. It's a really nice painting. You can get prints of it and commercial. I don't get a kickback. So Fig looked at this problem and said, yeah, let's see if we can do something about this. And so put together a working group, <coughs> uh, including these five fine people plus me, and said, all right, let, let's see if we can develop a standardized mechanism for event-like extensions. So our goals for PSR 14 were to allow libraries to expose events in a generic fashion that could then plug into any framework or any other system. We want to make it easy to register to listen to an event. Say, hey, this event happened, I want to now connect to it and take some action in response. And it needs to be easy to migrate to, because if no existing systems are willing to adopt it, well, it's a pretty useless standard at that point if people don't use it. What we were not trying to do, however, was event sourcing. Again, if you were here, for, if you're look, here looking for event sourcing, you're in the wrong room. We're not talking about asynchronous event loops. That's a completely different problem space. We also were not aiming for complete backward compatibility. These two are always the tricky balancing act in any standards effort. You want something that people can adopt, that is easy for people to adopt, 
At the same time, you don't want to have a standard that is simply, well, we made this mistake five years ago, so I guess we're stuck with this forever. That's not good either. Uh, a lot of the existing systems are designed the way they are because of limitations of PHP 5.3. We really don't need to be limited by PHP 5.3 anymore. Who's still running 5.3? Please upgrade. Please, for the love of God, upgrade. <laughs> All right. So what are we supposed to do with it? What is 14 supposed to do? The use cases we were looking at. There are a lot of different things you could do with event systems. There are four use cases in particular that we felt covered enough of the use cases that you know, everything else will fit into one of these. Notification. This is your traditional observer pattern. Thing happened, if you care, do stuff. Enhancement. Here's a thing, please change it before I do something with it. The canonical example here would be uh, like an ORM or a data layer. I'm about to save this object. If you want to modify it before I save it, do so. A lot of systems have this kind of functionality. Collection. Uh, this is very popular in registration systems uh, for plugins and so on. Give me a list of things I should care about. I will take that list of things and then do stuff with that full list. This is also a very common uh, extension mechanism. And the terribly named, because I couldn't come up with a better name for it, alternative chain. The canonical example here would be the Symfony's uh, view event in the kernel, uh, Zen or the uh, Zen Frameworks trigger until logic. <coughs> this is, I have a thing that needs to be done. One of y'all deal with it. As soon as someone has actually handled it, stop, because we don't need any other listeners to be triggered. So those are the, the use cases that pretty much every problem with the extension is going to fall into one of these. And this gave us a good picture of the types of things that need to be done. Our, the guidelines we were trying to work with, the type system is your friend. PHP's type system is pretty darn nice these days. It's nowhere near as nice as Rust's or something like that, but it is very powerful and we really should just l use that power. This is capabilities given to us by the language. Let's just use those. Composability, this is a good thing. If you can break your problem apart into discrete pieces and then assemble it, you have more power and more flexibility while using standard components. This is a good thing. And fu fundamentally, when designing a standard, you want to standardize as little as possible, but not so little that it's not useful. This is, again, a hard problem to, to solve. This is a hard balance point. I think we did a decent job in this case. Um, because you can, you want to give people enough surface area that they can rely on it, but not so much that they're uh, restricted by it. Enough talk. Let's see the spec. There's the spec. That's PSR 14. You can go. Home. I'll go home now. Really, it's just three one interface methods, so it's a very small surface area spec. Um, we have an event dispatcher, a listener provider, and then optionally, a stoppable event. One thing to note, we don't have a return type specified explicitly here, but it is required in the spec. We did that for backward compatibility reasons to make it easier for existing systems to adopt. But if you don't return an object here, you are in fact doing it wrong. <coughs> Important thing to note here though, there is no event interface. Why is there no event interface? Because we couldn't actually find a use for one. It, it, we considered having one, but it would have been a marker interface uh, with no interfaces, which does have some advantages, but there were also disadvantages to it, mostly around backward compatibility. And in the end, the backward compatibility argument won, so we left that out uh, to make life easier and transitions easier. How do you use it? Well, if you're a library author, it's really easy. You have a provider, you stick that into a dispatcher, and then you can throw events at the dispatcher and then you get back the same event object. You are required to always get back that exact same object every time without exception. Unless the exceptions are thrown, but that's another story. Uh, but the, the idea here, this is a convenience so that you can just pass a new object in and get it back and then examine uh, that object. So it's <clears throat> mostly just to make code a bit cleaner. Fundamentally, the split here, the provider's job is to map events to listeners. That's all it does, to say this event, these listeners are relevant to it. Actually calling those listeners is the dispatcher's job. 
This is the separation of concerns I was talking about earlier. Break things up, make them composable, gives you a lot more flexibility. I don't know any existing systems that have this split, but it's compatible with a lot of those existing systems, and it provides us way more flexibility and um, compatibility with different systems to mix and match different libraries. Your basic dispatcher is going to look like this. This is pretty much a complete dispatcher implementation, and you're not going to see much more than this. Maybe add some logging. Dispatchers are boring. But you, know, you can write your own. You can use one out of an existing system. There's a bunch written already. Um, but you know, just call the provider, you get, get an event, call the provider, and say, all right, get the listeners that are relevant, and then call that listener with that event. And it's any PHP callable. The, if the event has stoppable interf event interface, then check and see if it's supposed to stop. If so, skip everything else. That's the extent of the logic. That's the whole thing. If the event does not implement stoppable event interface, then there is no way for it to stop. You cannot skip listeners. It is a comp an unstoppable event. And I've decided that unstoppable event is the my new band name. <clears throat> One thing to note here, we have this is propagation stopped. There is no stop propagation method because explicitly stopping propagation is a place for bugs to come in. Uh, stoppability is just an API between the event and the dispatcher. How you stop it is a domain-specific question. We'll see an example of this in a little bit. <clears throat> Fundamentally, dispatchers are the API to a calling library. Providers are the API to frameworks. And, that, and they connect in the middle. So let's talk about providers, because that's where the fun part is. Providers can map an event to a listener based on anything it wants to. You can map it based on its type. You can map it based on some kind of metadata you've configured. You can care about permissions, say only you, these certain users are allowed to access these listeners. You can map it based on the day of the week if you're playing Fizzbin. They can order things if they care. They can have some kind of explicit priority that you've provided when you configure it. You can do some kind of fancy before and after ordering. It can be domain-specific logic, because in a specific use case, the ordering matters in a certain way and not in others. It can just return them randomly if, if it wants to. This is entirely up to the provider. You, as an implementer of a provider, can implement whatever logic you want. This is where the flexibility comes in. This is where the fun part is. And then the caller, actually the, the listener, is any PHP callable. Anonymous function, names function, uh, method of an object, whatever. <clears throat> so as long as it returns a thing you can invoke, it's legal. <clears throat> this also means, you know, so in practice, the, the class and interface is going to be most common because that gives us a unique identifier. There is no ID on an event. There is no standardized string name because that is less flexible than just saying, hey, the type itself is the name. The event's class name is the name of the event which also means we get to inherit parent classes, we get to inherit interfaces. You can now cluster events just based on, hey, they, it has this interface, therefore it's part of this group. Some event systems, like Laravel, have the ability to say, I want to register a listener for any events of this family, of this group. Well, here we go. The language itself gives us a way to define the group of an event. No extra work needed. OK, how do we get those listeners into a provider so it knows about them and can ma map events to them? Up to you. You can do it with some kind of explicit registration system, which is most common today. You can use reflection. You can have a, uh, some kind of explicit order if you want to. You can uh, have services uh, that hold listeners if you want to. You can have a compiled pr uh, provider, like a, a compiled event, excuse me, a provided. I'm awake. <laughs> A compiled container, you can also have a compiled event uh, or listener provider so that you get a lot more performance out of it. You can have it care about context. There's literally anything you want here is legal as long as it makes some logical sense for your problem space. As an example, uh, Tukio is a library uh, we built as, or I built as part of the uh, development process. This was kind of our reference implementation of PSR 14. It's now been released as its own library. You're free to download it and use it. Uh, Tukio is the Swahili word for event, <coughs> so you don't get confused. 
It includes an ordered listener provider where you can just call, hey, add listener and give it any callable. And it will reflect on the uh, parameter, uh, the parameter type, and say, all right, register for pizza arrived events. You can also say, hey, register this uh, method of an object with priority five. It's prior higher priority win, so this will happen before this provider. All of these methods also will give back some kind of key, so it's an opaque key, and then you can say, hey, add another listener, in this case just a normal function, that happens before this provider. So this listener will fire before this one. How it orders with respect to anything else, I don't care, but this is guaranteed to happen before that one. <clears throat> All this reflection work is actually really fast in practice. Re PHP reflection is surprisingly efficient. You can also uh, register services. So uh, give it any PSR11 compatible container, which is at this point most of them out there. And then say, hey, this service name, this method, listens to this class, because you can't reflect on it here, and then this priority. There's also before and after ordering support as well. You can also, just like Symfony, have uh, subscriber classes, which are the same idea. You put a bunch of listeners in one class and say, hey, pick up all of these together, in which case any method that begins with on is going to get recognized as a listener, and then we just reflect to get the type it should listen to. Uh, in this case, if pizza late is another listener, but it's not going to be automatically registered, so we do that explicitly. And in this case, it's going to listen to pizza arrived late events, which is a subclass of pizza arrived. So in case of pizza arrived, both of these listeners get called. In case of just a pizza arrived, actually in case of pizza arrived late, just this one gets called. That makes sense? That kind of how the reflection works and gives you that kind of grouping just for free? In practice, you're going to wire this up in your container, uh, just like you do today. That's, that's fine. It also supports compiled containers. So in this case, you can uh, use a provider builder. It has basically the same API. And then you can compile that out to a class on disk that has all of the ordering pre-computed. It's one big static list. This is the fastest you're going to get for a listener provider. If you're in some kind of com uh, compiled environments where you have um, uh, or compiled container already, this makes complete sense to do. And then at runtime, you just load up that provider, toss into a dispatcher from any provider or any vendor. It doesn't have to be from your own dispatcher. And then from there on, you're just using a dispatcher. That's all, all you care about. But that's not the only implementation. There are lots of other options. For example, uh, Benny Mack, another member of the working group, wrote this implementation called CART. Uh, which ex is actually a composer extension. And so you can say any classes in this directory are essentially subscribers. Load them up. Every public method on those classes is now a lit listener. Register it. Use reflection to determine which events to listen to. And then at runtime, you just load that class, and you now have a working provider that's pre-built. Toss it into your, excuse me, into your um, dependency injection container, toss it into a dispatcher, you're good to go. This is just off the shelf, open source, free to use. Or you can write your own. It's not that hard. It's a one method interface. It's really easy to implement something specific to your use case that is still then compatible with everything. Or your framework probably is going to come with a PSR 14 implementation. Symphony, Laminas, formerly Zen Framework, Yi, and Typo3 have already announced they are sh going to support PSR 14. Um, I think Symphony 4.3 is already out, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's already out. So that's a, a PSR 14 compatible implementation now. Uh, Laminas, their next release is going to be PSR 14. Uh, Typo 3, Benny Mac is working on that uh, conversion as we speak. Uh, Ye 3 is announced they are supporting it. So it's already everywhere or will be soon. And if you're using a framework that isn't supporting it, guess what? You get to file a feature request. All right, so that's great for s triggering messages, but how do we get data back from the listener to the, the caller? How do we have that bi-directional communication, which you often do need? 
So the way to do that is you modify the event. The spec itself does not say if an event is mutable or not, just that it is an object, which means it's up to you to decide if it's an immutable object or not. Your call. The same object is passed through, but if there's no modifier methods on it, guess what? It's immutable. And you get all the benefits of that. Or if you do want to be able to pass data back, you give it a modifier method. And OK, you know, you, listeners can just modify the object, and that's how you pass data back. The return value of a listener is always void. That's just not used at all. This means the event is part of your domain model. The event is not just a blob. It is something you need to design and specify for your use case, for your problem space, what API makes sense, which you should be doing anyway because it's your API. It's your responsibility as an author to make sure that whatever API you design actually works. PSR 14 is just a matter of getting that API from one place to another. So let's look at an example. Uh, it's going to show off a number of these, uh, these use cases. <clears throat> We're going to talk about access control. We're going to use PSR 14 for uh, access control. We're going to say access is permitted. You know, you're allowed to take this action if and only if at least one listener says, yes, this user can do this. None of them say, no, this user may not. And listeners can also say, I don't care. It's a pretty straightforward algorithm. Uh, I've implemented this before in less nice ways because I didn't have this tooling available yet. But it's pretty straightforward. What does this look like? Here's our event. It's pretty simple, in fact. Uh, in this case, we're going to say it's for an access check for an object, uh, like a, a document object for a, um, your, your ORM. We have a constructor that just takes that document. Listeners can access that document to analyze it and say, OK, you know, what should I do with it? What are the details? And they can then call allow or deny, which just sets this internal flag. The caller can then call allowed to say, hey, what, what's the result here? Should this action be allowed or not? And we're also going to say, if that allowed flag gets set to false, we don't need to call any more listeners. We're done. This is the relevant business logic because we know at this point what our end condition is. We don't need to, to rely on the listeners to say, I've set deny, and therefore you can stop. That's integrated into the API that we've designed here. And then we have individual uh, classes for specific types of events. In this case, they don't have any additional behavior. They could if you wanted to. It's, it's up to you. But this means we can now listen to any access check or only certain types of access check. You want to add another type of access check here? Great. Add another class. You're done. Our listeners, nice and simple. I'm going to use uh, Tukio in this example just to have some code to show. We have a provider that listens on every access check and says, if the current user is a guest, then tell them to go away. They cannot actually do anything as a guest. We have another one that says, for update only, check and see if uh, the owner of the object is the current user and that user has a certain permission. Then we'll let them access the object and take this, uh, have this update action. If not, we're going to have no opinion. Someone else may say yes. Maybe there's an admin check. Someone else may say no, whatever. We're doing as little as possible. Note, it's default block. So this means if nobody ends up saying yes, it's, uh, it's still blocked. Everyone with me on that? Cool. All the caller then needs to do, though, is dispatch, hey, we're going to send an update access check for this document, throw it into the dispatcher, and say, did that say we should care or we should allow it or not? I don't care who the listeners were. I'm just going to say, one of them said yes, none of them said no, therefore, I'll, I'll do what I should do. <clears throat> if you want to change your business logic, you want to change what the rules are, say, at least two, classes, two listeners need to say no for some reason, or you have a stronger no, all of those changes just happen in the event object. Your event object contains business logic. Your event object is part of your business rules. And that's OK, because that gives you a single place to make any changes to your access logic. All you need to care about here in the caller is, did my access routine say I should or should not uh, allow access here? 
And again, we don't need to worry about stoppability here. No one worries about stoppability except the event itself, which means we're guaranteed to have a known final state at the end. Basically, access check is your entire API. And you can use this with any dispatcher and any provider. You, as an, a library author, can use it with anything. You are completely independent of everything except PSR 14 itself. In fact, you can go a step further and write a custom provider that is specific to your business logic. And say, we're going to add, uh, it's going to be a listener provider. It has the get listeners for events method that's part of the standard. And it has an add voter method that takes a, a listener, which it's going to call a voter instead of a listener. So it's specific to that domain. And we're just going to flag, is this voter able to deny uh, access? Is it, does it ever call deny? In which case, we can call all of those first, since if something's going to short circuit, it'll be one of those. It's a minor, a minor performance improvement. Because order doesn't matter in this case aside from that. Beyond that, order is irrelevant. This is cool. We now have a PSR 14 compatible caller, event, and provider that can plug into any system. But a, a dispatcher only takes one provider. So does that mean we need multiple dispatchers in the system? Fortunately, no, because a dispatcher only requires a provider. It doesn't care how the provider works. You can have a provider that just delegates to other providers. In this case, uh, it's an aggregate provider. You can just throw additional providers at it, and then when called, it doesn't look up listeners. It just iterates over all of those providers and gives back a list of the listeners from those. We can now concatenate providers very easily. In fact, you don't need to write this code yourself. It's provided in a utility package that we already wrote for you. Just download that package off of uh, Packagist, and you have this class, and you can stream together multiple uh, providers. <coughs> in fact, we go a step further. You can delegate providers. This is a bit more complex, but you have some kind of map from this type of event should call these providers, this type of event should call these providers, this type of event should call these providers. There's actually a, an API here to configure that, I'm, but I, don't, I can't fit on, uh, that on a slide. And then when get listeners for event is called, we iterate our provider list and say, all right, is this event one of these we've specified? That should go to just these providers. Okay, call just those providers. If it's n none of those, then we call some default provider and return the listeners from that one. <clears throat> so we can now branch our providers. This is cool. Put that all together, this code makes a bit more sense bottom up. Our dispatcher uh, only has one provider. That provider is a delegating provider. If given an access check uh, event, we'll call the access check provider specifically, to that vo voter we just talked about. Otherwise, it'll call a default. What's that default? That default is an aggregate provider that just concatenates a pre-compiled provider and one we can configure at runtime for last minute things that are conditional to one specific request. That much code, and we can now stitch together providers from any number of vendors, any number of libraries, any number of frameworks, and they all just cleanly fold together. This is where splitting the dispatcher and the provider really, really wins. We've never had this kind of flexibility before in any system. Now we do. <coughs> cool. One more example I want to give you. Deferred events. There are a lot of cases where you're going to fire off an event, and you don't care what the result is. You're not going to ask for data back from the listeners. And it's OK if things happen later. In fact, I assume they're going to happen later because they're slow. I don't want to wait for them. I want to just keep on going, and I don't care what happens to the event. It can happen asynchronously for all I care. So you want to be able to say, as the caller, hey, do, do this stuff later. That's good enough. And we struggled with this question for a long time until we realized that, no, you don't actually, as the dispatcher, know that. You, as the caller, don't know if the listener is going to be slow or not. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Maybe that listener is going to iterate your entire database. It shouldn't, 
But you as the dispatcher don't know that. <coughs> That's the point. Only the listener author knows whether it's safe to defer the action of that listener to some later time. This was a big struggle we had during the design of the system. Eventually, it was, we realized Laravel does have a way to flag that this uh, should happen later, this is deferrable, it should happen in a queue, but it's on the listener, not the dispatcher side. And that's really where it should be. <coughs> so let's look at an example of that in action. Say, some event happened, I wanted to send an email. Email is slow, you don't want to have to block your web request on that, so how can we make that delayable? When we have a listener that is send an email, but we don't want to take the time to send an email right now. Toss into a queue. Have some kind of uh, setup that's just, we're using AMQP here uh, for the queuing system, and this is just some basic setup code. And then our listener can look like this. When a document is saved, then we'll just queue up, hey, here's the document ID that was saved. We'll serialize that, toss it into the queue, and we're done. That's the listener. The action of the listener is not send email. The action of the listener is write a queue object or a queue message to save uh, to send an email later. <clears throat> and then we can do that generically. For any given event, do we want to make it run later? There are lots of different ways of doing that. Uh, what I'm going to show here is uh, just one. We can have a provider that is capable of queuing messages under certain circumstances. <clears throat> so it's going to take, this takes multiple slides, unfortunately. Uh, it's going to take a container, and it's going to take uh, a channel, a queue channel. And then if the channel is defined, then we will go ahead and initialize that, make sure that we have a, a queue to write into. And then we can register a listener with it. This is, I'm only covering uh, service here. You can cover, uh, a real version would cover more than this. And we then can just switch. If the uh, li listener is queuable that we're adding, and there is a channel available we can queue into, then we do one thing and register a listener. Otherwise, we just make a listener right now for the service. In either case, we have a callable, and that's what we put into our list of callables to run, including the, the type to listen to, the event type. What do those do? Well, make listener for service. This is the non-queuable case. Just takes a, you know, the, the service name and method and returns a new callable. This is the actual listener, this here, which pulls the service out of the container and calls the method on it in turn. This is code is directly out of 2QO. This is essentially the same code that Symfony uses, more or less, or the same technique at least. And right here we have any service we can wrap up into a callable, wrap up into a lazy listener. For a queuable service, we do something similar. In this case, <coughs> we return a new anonymous function. This is the actual listener that We'll just queue up that same information and shove it into a queue and uh, publish that. Important thing to note here, we are loading the uh, event itself into the queue. This means the event object needs to be serializable. If it's not serializable, this will break. Therefore, make your events serializable unless you have a specific business reason not to. And you may. In some systems, you may, you know, if you are saving an object and that object is in an active record design, it probably has a transitive dependency on the database connection itself, so you can't serialize it. It's on you to make sure you don't do that because trying to force that is kind of impossible, and there are use cases where you do need to have a larger series of uh, dependencies from the event object. Again, this is part of your domain, so it's on you to get it right and design your own API appropriately. And then the get listeners for event does something very simple. It just iterates over the listeners, checks if the type is compatible, and if so, return that listener. 
what's returned here will always be one of those two uh, anonymous functions. That's all it will ever be, just with different bindings. So that's completely fine. That level of, ab of abstraction breaks nothing. And then your queue runner is very simple. Ignore this part, this is just routine uh, AMQP setup. The important part is this is your queue worker, which will just get a message, unserialize that message, and do exactly the same thing we saw before. Take the container, grab the service out of it, call the method with the event object. Because this is nice and standardized, this is completely generic code, and we can now take any listener and toss it off to a queue in any system. <coughs> and this will work anywhere. You'll also notice n in none of this discussion did I talk about the dispatcher at all. It's completely irrelevant. Every dispatcher is inherently compatible with this. Every caller is inherently compatible with this. So in summary, for those who have been distracted by email for all this time, if you are a library author, you now have a universal extension target. You want to make your library extensible, you want to make your library uh, flexible, you want to let others plug into the workflow of your application, use PSR 14. You are now dependent on one interface and compatible with everything. If you're a framework author, you only need to worry about writing a provider. You can write a dispatcher if you want, or use someone else's, that's boring. Either way, but <clears throat> all you need to do is write a provider. Or just use one off the shelf, because there are already multiple implementations that are compatible of both dispatchers and providers. If you're starting a new framework today for some reason, I don't know why, you don't need to write this anymore. It's just a, pro a solved problem, you can pull this these libraries off the shelf, or let people pick their own. Writing domain-aware providers is really easy. So you can have something that doesn't even look like it's PSR 14, as long as it's a provider that has an API that makes sense for your business case and implements that provider interface, you can now drop that into any workflow in any framework in any application as long as it uses PSR 14. And it just works with no code duplication. Which means, yay, we have increased the interoperability of the world and that is in fact the goal. But, uh, some further reading here. I do recommend check out the specification itself. There is more text on it than just three interfaces, yes. Um, so it is worth reading, it's not long. Also check out the meta documents, which explains some of the logic behind our decisions. Um, if you're more of the reading type, I also have a very long blog series uh, that covers essentially the same uh, content as this, but I go into more detail, have a couple more examples uh, showing off even more options, more things you can do with PSR 14. Here's our reference implementation again, and Go ahead and just grab the library. That package contains the interfaces and you're good to go. Thank you.